Hey folks, I'm Matt and welcome to The Good Trouble Show. In finance, the term black swan event refers to an economic incident that was impossible to predict and has potentially severe consequences for the global financial system. So, you know, take for example, uh, 9-11 or the COVID-19 pandemic. Those, those would be examples of a black swan event. Uh, the government disclosure of a non-human intelligence would certainly uh, uh, pretty much be a catastrophic black, black swan event. And today we have one of the world's leading financial experts to discuss this very possibility. Uh, but first, please hit the subscribe and thumbs up buttons on YouTube. Leave a comment and let us know what you think about this episode. You can also find us on uh, X uh, slash Twitter at Good Trouble Show and all other social media platforms at The Good Trouble Show. Uh, you can also find us wherever you enjoy your podcasts. Just search for The Good Trouble Show with Matt Ford. And we, as always, need your help keeping the lights on. You can become a Patreon member of The Good Trouble Show for the price of a coffee by going going to www.patreon.com forward slash uh, the Good Trouble Show and uh, sign up. We have various uh, plans uh, for you there, all the way from just a cup of coffee to owning the the whole uh, the whole coffee store. Uh, finally, uh, I, as always, uh, would like to thank everyone that supports our show. Uh, we had to pre-tape today's show because I'll actually be out of town Sunday, so we don't have our normal uh, normal chats open. Uh, but as always, we appreciate everyone that tunes into our show live, and as always, we appreciate uh, everyone uh, that supports the show, both uh, behind the scenes. And, uh, and all of you that are, that are watching it. So for over 25 years, our next guest has worked in global macroeconomics, trading, and risk management. He is the managing principal of the global macro trading firm, DAM, and one of the pioneers in voluntary carbon offsets. Here to discuss the global economic impact of UAP, UAP disclosure on the markets, please welcome David Dorr. David, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, Matt. Thank you for having me on your show. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming on. Now, you're—I uh, understand that you're—you're uh, you're, uh, a little bit further down south from where I'm at here in uh, Los Angeles, right? I am. Yeah, it looks a little bit like the mountains behind me. I'm—I'm uh, I'm actually in the <laughs> Andes. I, I'm uh, in Medellin, Colombia, right now, which is is home for me. I spent half the year here. Wonderful wow. place to be. Awesome. Yeah. I, last time I was there, I think was 1994. I was touring with Whitney Houston at the time. So there was a, quite, a, quite a long time since I uh, had been there, but I just remember it being a really beautiful country and everyone you know, super, super friendly. So uh, anyway, so thanks for joining us. So tell us a little bit about, about yourself. Sure. So my background is a uh, career background in global macro, as well as uh, fintech. I uh, started in the trading sector when I was a teenager, grew up in the Midwest, exposed to trading commodity futures um, very early on in that uh, kind of exploration of you know building a career path. I was fascinated by um, global macro investors like Jim Rogers, George Soros, and their exploration of the world around and how the world connected together. And that's how I got into global macro investing, which is a top-down approach looking at the world and looking at how different things connect together, whether that's the changes in, you know, conflict, war, changes in, you know, interest rates, changes in weather, whatever the case may be. Uh, Global Macro looks at how all those things are, are linked together. So I've been fortunate enough that uh, to build a career path out of that. Now, what exactly does your firm uh, DAM do? Uh, you're, you're the co-founder of it. So explain to someone that maybe doesn't have much, uh, much of a background, such as myself, in economics and finance, what, uh, what is DAM and what does it do specifically? Yeah, as I as I like to tell folks, we're we're effectively uh, butterfly butterfly chasers. So um, for those in the audience that have heard of the butterfly effect, you know when a butterfly flaps its wings in California, and it creates a tsunami in in Japan. This is precisely what my firm looks to do. We look to see where where events can ripple across markets or policies or many other uh, things, and we make investment decisions accordingly. And whether that's investing in commodities, stocks, bonds, currencies, whatever is available uh, to us. Um, as we like to say, you know, we strive to be niche players in big markets and big players in, in niche markets. Um, and so our entire job is really connecting dots before before others in the market do. Got it. Now, now we're, of course, we're going to talk about UAP today. So when did you first become interested in the whole topic of UAPs or what other people know as, uh, or what most people know as UFOs? 
Yeah, I was fortunate to grow up around the topic. So my entire in my entire life, I've been exposed to it. And that's really thanks to my father, who was really, really, really into not just UFOs, but the paranormal. And my father encouraged me and my brothers to always have an open mind. He said, you know, the world, the universe is, is mysterious. You should be open to many things that you may not understand or, or that others perhaps don't even believe. But you should also be, you know, grounded as well and look for evidence. So so my father always had a balanced approach to that. In fact, I think that's a lot of what influenced, you know, my choice going into to global macro. So fortunately for me, I was, you know, surrounded by the literature, uh, UFO books of every type, ESP books, you know, lined my bedroom, bedroom wall as a child. So I've been around it a long time. Right, so I'm saying here, I, I think I was around nine years old when I when I first became really interested in the whole interested in the whole topic, and it it is uh, definitely a rabbit hole. And much as yourself, my my dad in particular, he was very encouraging of of uh, looking into things, especially my aunt who who uh, who passed away unfortunately uh, recently, but you know, she really imparted on me that uh, uh, imparted upon me that the universe that we live in is much more complex and interesting than what we just see with uh, with our naked eye. So, okay. So, so you're a finance guy and you're interested in, uh, in this whole UAP issue. At what point did you begin to consider the potential economic impact of impact of UAP disclosure? Yeah, pretty much right away. So there was a, a turning point where UAP and UFOs went from a you know childhood hobby and something I'd always stayed abreast of to crossing into my professional career in, in global macro. And the the two thing themes are of course very much related. It doesn't get more macro than you know talking about UAPs. So what happened was in 2017 when. Um, there was a, a phase shift, right? You had Ralph Blumenthal, Leslie Keen with their articles that came out, the videos that were released, you know, through the DOD, Lou Elizondo, Chris, and and, and the other fellows. Um, that was a pivotal moment that I, I said, this is an inflection point. This is a complete narrative shift here. There is something going on that is going to, you know, to grow. And, um, and this is important for us to follow. So, that moment, we knew that it was going to be impactful. A great way to think about the the impact is if you bring up slide three. Okay. Excuse me, slide two. Yes. Um, this is a this is an exercise I do with a lot of folks to think about impact. And the way that I frame it is that you have to learn to think exponential. And this is an unnatural thing for for homo sapiens to do. We think linear. If you have to run from a jaguar chasing you, you need to be able to project out to climb up a tree or jump over a canyon or whatever the case may be. But the exponential function is found in nature as well. And one of the things we look for in, in determining impact is where there might be be exponential movements. So this slide here is a great representation of that. So we're going to play this 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 kind of mental game here. I want you to imagine that you're handcuffed to the top of a stadium, your favorite baseball stadium, wherever that may be, your favorite team. And it's 11 a.m. in the morning. It's 11 a.m. and you're handcuffed to the top. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop one drop of water on the pitcher's mound. One minute later, I'm going to add two drops. Another minute later, I'm going to add four and so on. So those drops are going to double every minute, not every second, just every minute. So the question that I pose to, to new traders or anybody else learning how the exponential function works is at what time do you need to be able to get out of the stadium before you drown? So it's 11 a.m., drop one, 11.01, two drops, and so on. Now, most people in the audience are trying to calculate this in their head and they're thinking, maybe I've got a day to escape. Maybe I've got 10 hours, five hours, the answer blows almost everybody away. You have 45 minutes. Wow. So you don't even make it to noon. Yeah. So it's a profound example of, of how fast the exponential function is. And it's a great way to, to think about things like impact. And it's important to note that at 1144, the stadium is only half full. At 1143, it's only a quarter full. So things start slowly and gradually. But then that doubling function becomes very, very meaningful. And it's for that reason that I think this topic is so urgent because my personal belief and the belief of my firm is that we're already moving up that exponential curve. Now, in your experience, are your fellow traders, are they paying attention to this whole UAP thing uh, as well or as closely as you are? 
it, it seems to be limited. Um, you know, the example that we use with traders in, in conversation, and if you bring up slide three, this is this is how I break it down. Also, try to give them some mental models. Um, so, a lot of them when I first talk to them, they're like, "Oh, it's impossible," or if it's possible, the odds of it are highly, highly, highly unlikely. And so, the example I use is playing the lottery, right? So, the odds of winning the Powerball are approximately one in three hundred million. But the financial results of that are life changing. And that's why millions of Americans play Powerball every day. Now, taking apart the financial gains that are possible here, what I pose to them is look, if there's even a one in 300 million chance that UFOs and aliens, you know, or UAPs and NHI, as the new terms are, that that's real, then the impact is much, much, much greater than the Powerball. And so you wouldn't be doing your job as a trader or a professional investment portfolio manager if you're not at least carving out a little bit of brain space to think about it. And so that's how we're trying to get people to, you know, kind of open up to it and say, hey, look, I've got to at least give a little bit of time to this. And that's starting to happen, but it's still very, very, very limited. Yeah, I, I can totally see that. Now, just a few weeks ago, uh, Colonel Carl Nell had this to say at the ISALT conference in New York City. So non-human intelligence exists. Non-human intelligence has been interacting with humanity. This interaction is not new, and it's been ongoing. And there are unelected people in the government that are aware of that. And, and so, Carl, that is quite a bold statement. Um, I'm wondering, and I'm curious, how confident are you that that is true? There's zero doubt. Uh, he, was, he was very, very definitive in, in what he said there. There was no sort of uh, waffling around with, with what he had to say. And, and I think that that was probably one of the most concise statements I've ever heard from a former national security official that, that you know, we are not dealing with Russian or Chinese drones, that there indeed is a non-human intelligence that's here, it's been here, it has been interacting with us, and the fact that there are non-elected government officials that know about this and have obviously been hiding it uh, from, you know, from pretty much everyone. So my question uh, uh, is, since, you know, since that pretty you know, widely viewed uh, uh, sort of appearance at, at this ISALT conference. When you talk to investors following uh, uh, Carl Nell's, uh, Colonel Nell's uh, comment about non-human intelligence uh, uh, you know, at this Wall Street conference, uh, what, was, what was their sort of reaction? Uh, and, you know, and, and moreover, like, how, how do you think that his statement at the SALT conference how is it viewed among the investing community uh, and how are they interpreting it or or did it just completely fly under their radar no oh, it it definitely was was worthwhile and and kudos to to alex and the you know the salt uh conference venue for for two years in a row now right so last right. year they had dr gary nolan out there and, and this year you know colonel mel and, and i mean first of all like anybody paying attention which is not nearly enough is that's nothing less than absolutely profound. These gentlemen are not mincing their words when they're they're telling the audience what they what they believe to to be true. Um, now, what I found from it is that I did get phone calls. So, friends of mine that run hedge funds and you know been listening to me, you know, talk about this for for several years now. Um, a handful of them actually called and they said, you know what? Hey, we saw the you know we saw the clip from from Salt, and um, I guess what you're saying is is true. So. Those types of venues do help with credibility and they do provoke thought amongst, you know, especially institutional managers. So there's, it's a good starting point. What's interesting is that it's, you're still not seeing people know what to do about it. It's kind of like, that's interesting, but what am I supposed to do? I have right. not seen or heard of any, you know, kind of major institutional power players um, doing anything important about it. And I think that will change, and I think it's going to change very quickly. Um, so it's a good step along the way. And and I want to get into sort of the, the more de uh, kind of dig into the details as far as the potential economic impact of UAP disclosure. But you know, I've always you know people say, ah, oh, you know, what's the reason for the cover up? Is it because people will go bananas when they hear about it, or it'll it'll disrupt uh, uh, religion, that sort of thing? But in my view, I have always kind of felt that perhaps one of the main reasons that they have kept this under wrap is the potential economic disruption. What are your thoughts on that? 
undisputedly there, there's there's gonna be economic disruption and it's and it's quite complex because of the fragility of the world right now. Even if we were to take the topic of UAP and NHI out of the equation, the world's in a really, really stressful place. Um, any given year, so 25 years doing global macro, what we look for is we try and kind of hunt down three or four themes that could be um, large moving exponential events, whether positive or, or negative. And this year, I mean, it's the most of my career, there's, there's nearly two dozen things going on. They're all you know, potential large moves in, in markets. So the impact is real. I do think that the United States government is aware of that. I think they're struggling to know what to do about that. I think there's also a lot of concern about the, you know, the, the baggage that goes with it. Like if you, if you're the guy that opens up that suitcase and you tell the, you know, the American public, then you've got lots and lots and lots of questions that are going to come up real fast and you're not going to be prepared to, to answer them. So yeah, economic disruption, I, I believe is inevitable, but that shouldn't stop the process. You don't not, you know, if your only, only path forward is to go down a dirt road, you don't not drive down it. You try and put good shocks on your car and, and go down cautiously. But, um, that's where we're at. It's, it's going to shake markets, but you know, the smarter we are about it and, and having good dialogue is going to be better than, than the alternative. Yeah. And I think this touches a good bit on what Colonel Mel spoke about at the Seoul conference in terms of, um, you know, sort of like catastrophic disclosure versus, uh, you know, versus controlled disclosure. And I, I think, you know, I think one of the things that, that, I find like most disturbing about all of this. I mean, of course, there's the aspect that we have this non-human intelligence that's interacting and is here, but yeah. just the fact that all of these world governments, or at least the United States, see, is seemingly burying their head in the sand on this whole thing. And uh, you know, much as just what you just spoke about from an economic point of view, burying your head in the sand with something that is is uh, definitely coming is is just not a just not a good, uh, good. Uh, it's, it's just not the right plan that I think any of us, any of us, should be following. Now, I, one one thing that I've kind of sat and thought about, and others as well, is to me it seems like the most economically sort of destabilizing effect of UAP disclosure. Uh, the impact that it would have as far as disruption would be in the energy sector. I mean, after all, if you think about it, everything revolves around oil. You know, you've got transportation, you've got food, you know, food production, delivering the food, all of that sort of thing. Uh, you've got uh, the political power that uh, uses energy uh, as, as uh, you know, as a weapon to exer exert uh, political influence. How would the energy market adjust uh, to the revelation of this new energy source, which is clearly not oil based? Yeah, I think, you know, we postulated as a as a firm, you know, is Lockheed Martin or Raytheon, for example, are they the next energy company? Right. So, you know, should they be trading, you know, at multiples of where Exxon or Chevron is at? Um, maybe. Maybe that's a possibility. So there's definitely going to be disruption to to energy overall. I think that that will be you know much needed, extremely helpful. If we were doing this even 10, 20 years ago, um, there might be a bigger power struggle. And I'm not suggesting that there's zero power struggle. Certainly, I would imagine there is behind the scenes. Um, but that being said, is you know also working in environmental markets and carbon credits and everything else, there is a enormous, enormous momentum in the institutional markets for divesting from fossil fuel companies and investing in clean energy companies. So if ever there were a moment to bring this out and, and see cheers and celebration, it's right now. Um, and the urgency, you know, for our planet as well is, is, is quite obvious. Do you have a, a, a kind of like hypothesis as far as like how the government and uh, the energy sector could work together to sort of minimize volatility in the market? I think the first thing is that we we have to have the uh, the type of family conversations that you know you have at the dinner table but are tough to have. If we don't embrace that and get that out of the way, all the rest is is going to be extremely difficult. So it's an incredible opportunity for leadership. So any politicians that are you know listening to your show, of which I know there's many, um, this leadership opportunity is a once in a lifetime opportunity. We need to have those dinner table conversations and say, hey, look, this is this is what's going 
going on. And then you can get to, you know, collaborative efforts. Um, the collaborative efforts are, are going to be difficult without restoring some semblance of, of trust in the institutions that, that matter to us. And I'll use a perfect example of this, that I was having a conversation with a friend of mine that's close to the DOE, um, actually this morning. He was sharing an article that the DOE is getting ready to invest $900 million in, in basically new designs in, in nuclear reactors. Okay, great. Much needed. Certainly so. But how upset is the public going to be if we're spending nearly a billion dollars? And of course, the money in the energy sector is trillions of dollars. But how upset is the public going to be that they're writing a check for nearly a billion dollars when maybe they've already figured out how to harness, you know, next generation, you know, UFO uh, technology. And I suspect that they have. I suspect that they actually understand the technology a lot better than than has been let on. That's a problem. That's a credibility issue. So we have to we have to get past the credibility issue first before we can get to collaboration. Yeah, I've, I've always kind of thought even and I didn't even think about it from like an energy perspective. But if you if you stop and you think about like how much money in R&D and deployment of just like our our space based systems, you know, just the just the other night, uh, I noticed that Elon uh, launched uh, another rocket out of Vandenberg. So the what I would yes. dare say trillions and trillions of dollars that we have spent on this remarkably in a way, you know, at least comparative to what is the potential tech of from non human intelligence. Uh, it's almost like we're we're dealing with uh, you know with a horse and buggy versus what what they're what uh, what they clearly have which is way more way far more advanced. So you know if you're a Northrop Grumman or a Lockheed uh, Martin that that holds this tech and they've had it all along, I I would imagine that a lot of people would be very very upset uh, with you know with these uh, with these private contractors but moreover uh, the government well and we'll dig a little bit more into the private contractor defense uh, contractor uh, side for this but one thing I've you know I've always kind of wondered so for instance uh, and again I'm not a finance guy I've no economics background so you know I'm kind of looking at it from a sort of remedial point of view but let's just say an example would uh, be Apple so I would imagine that Apple has probably on the bench the next, we'll say like 10 iterations of smartphones. Uh, but as opposed to just yeah. like dumping it all at once, they they very slowly uh, roll it out uh, is to, in, in from where I sit, you know, seems like a, a smart business decision uh, you know, to sort of uh, maximize the revenue off of each model rather than uh, jumping to the most advanced thing that you have and having to wait like another five years before you're able to have like a, a sort of another a big a jump in tech. So my question is, so that it, it would seem that let's say that Northrop Grumman or Lockheed Martin has this, uh, this uh, non-human tech in their possession that they have managed to figure out reverse engineer and already have a plan to uh, to deploy it it seems to me that the time to market for this tech would would have to be a considerable considerable amount of time if, if that is the case and let's say that that they say yes this is this is what we have but they roll it out slowly like Apple does with an iPhone would that aside from the ontological shock of this whole thing which is obvious but from a from a finance point of view would that soften the global market's reaction if they were uh, uh, kind of drug it out in terms of how how fast they roll this tech out uh, to market it's a great question and i and i think the answer to that is that it's it's not going to work um doing it slow 20 years ago it absolutely would have but there's there's a new phenomenon that's going on that investors still don't have their their brains around. And I'm going to give some very precise, you know, examples of this AI, which of course is is sure. a buzz. So a year ago, we told investors, investors were asking us, hey, are you trading, you know, NVIDIA and Microsoft and everything else? And we said, no, we think that those those stocks are going to be overinflated and they're going to be a great short. And the reason for it, this is actually a really profound example. So the reason for it is that we were tracking what was going on in the open source community with AI. So you've got thousands of people working in open source code, and they were very fast on the heels of open AI. A year ago, they were already running the equivalent of, you know, chat GPT-3 while well, chat GPT-4 was out and it costs you nothing. It's completely free. So what I would submit to people is, you know, what's the value of Microsoft's AI investment and, you know, a $90 billion valuation at open AI if, you know, some kids at, at university 
university with 600 bucks can duplicate that. Okay. And now, and this is, goes back to these exponential curves. And again, I want to, you know, kind of expand on this example. So people realize just how complicated these themes are today. So, so you see that. So now open source is basically, you know, getting ready to just eat the lunch of everybody that's running closed sourced artificial intelligence. Okay. So that's on the software side. Now let's jump to the hardware side company earlier this year kind of revealed themselves called Grok, not to be confused with Elon Musk's uh, AI system, Grok. Okay. It's a company, G. Yeah, it's a company called Grok, G-R-O-Q. So what ah, have they okay. done? What they realized was that GPUs made by NVIDIA were not the best type of chip to be using for large language models. So they invented what's called an LPU, so a language processing unit, a specialized chip. It's way faster it's way cheaper. It's incredibly, incredibly uh, interesting technology. Okay. So same thing, friends that I talked to last year that said, okay, maybe, you know, maybe I, I invest in AI, maybe I don't. Now they're rushing into this company. This company is doing a round right now, raising a ton of money. And a friend of mine asked me, he said, okay, well, now this is going to disrupt NVIDIA. So I want to be with this company that's disrupting. Well, this is how fast disruption is taking place. There's now work on organoid chips. So literally using, you know, uh, neurons and connecting it to motherboards to, to build chips and all this other stuff that's above my pay grade. But the, the point that I, I want to make, Matt, and the challenge for Raytheon or Lockheed or an Apple, anybody that's rolling stuff out in slow speed, it, it just doesn't work anymore. The cycle of disruption is so cannibalistic. It's absolutely mind bending. Um, and that's disrupting the equilibrium for investors to make, you know, good calculated decisions. Understood. So, okay. So, so let's assume that you own shares in a major uh, defense contractor, like uh, we'll just say Northrop uh, Grumman. Uh, wink, wink. Uh, so, let's assume you you <laughs> you own. I'm dropping dropping a little hint there. So, let's say theoretically uh, Northrop uh, Grumman uh, has uh, several of these uh, vehicles from our neighbors, uh, from not around here, uh, stashed in in various locations across uh, across the United States. Theoretically, they have have this. Uh, okay, so let's assume that that you know you own shares in Northrop Grumman and you know and they have in possession a beyond next uh, tech generation of non-human craft that is of of you know really pretty considerable value, uh, you know either you know be it the materials or the crashed craft itself uh, which of course would would I would think have considerable uh, considerable value especially if they're intact. Now it, it seems that the current price of those shares for Northrop uh, Grumman uh, reflects uh, neither sort of uh, uh, you know the the upside value of the asset or nor the downside value of the asset. So uh, let's say, for instance, that uh, theoretically Northrop uh, Grumman were uh, given uh, off-world vehicles by the government, and it was done under uh, you know without the, without the government didn't give. Uh, bidding opportunities to, let's say, uh, Lockheed Martin or uh, or Boeing. So Northrop Grumman, who uh, has or potentially has this stuff in their in their possession. I mean, that, to me, that seems like that would be a pretty uh, significant uh, liability in terms of of uh, litigation or whatnot. Or we'll just say, uh, theoretically, a uh, Northrop Grumman has. Uh, uh, we'll just say. Uh, uh, engaged in uh, retaliation against whistleblowers and other people that might uh, reveal their uh, theoretical uh, uh, holdings there. So, how how do they handle that? So, how would this imp how would this if you are a holder of Northrop Grumman stock? How would that? impact your position as a shareholder and what actions would you take? Would, you know, would you say levy a, a lawsuit against Northrop Grumman and that says, hey, you know, everything that you've been uh, telling the public in the SEC about the valuation of, of your company, you've been mis misrepresenting to your shareholders because of what you have that you can't talk about and the liabilities that you have uh, that you cannot talk about. You know, how how would what would how would you handle that or you know or anybody for that matter that uh, has uh, sh uh, shares in say Northrop uh, Grumman or Lockheed Martin etc. Sure. Well, let's give the audience a reference point. If you pull up the uh, the next slide there, that's got a chart 
of the the aerospace defense companies. So this is a chart. The that kind of reddish pink line there is the uh, the ETF, which is uh, ticker symbol ITA, and that's an ETF of the aerospace defense companies uh, together. The uh, turquoise line there is the S and P five hundred, the the most global benchmark that there is around the world for investing. And you can see that effectively the aerospace defense industry is handsomely outperforming the S and P five hundred. So these are companies that make a ton of money. Of course, we all know their their business. Model. Models. But you raise a, a really important question, Matt, is that what what happens, you know, one of the things that we think about often is whether or not it's even appropriate for aerospace defense companies to be U.S. public companies. The burdens upon U.S. public companies, most of which are, are appropriately placed, um, requires immense disclosure and transparency for investors to make calculated decisions. And I can certainly, in full disclosure, I have no position in any of the aerospace defense companies at all right now. Um, I can make strong arguments for either way. One, where their stock explodes up because, holy crap, they've got, you know, the most amazing tech in in, in the world. Um, and equally, you know, their stock collapses because of, you know, legal issues and litigation that could easily come. Um, imagine that, you know, it's definitive that we find out that, you know, these contractors have hurt people, which is, you know, reasonable to, to, to believe has has occurred. If that's the case, I mean, you know, the, the divestment in their stock from institutions would be swift. Um, and again, I, I would call on the, you know, the C-suite of these firms, and I'm sure they're, they're sweating bullets on this stuff. You have a once in a lifetime opportunity to get ahead of this and really start thinking about what you want to do. And, you know, getting that organized immediately is, is really important. And I think that, you know, while there's still room for kind of cooperation and negotiation, because I think all of us would understand that, you know, despite, you know, perhaps bad deeds, some of reality is they are in an awkward spot, right? You have these things, you were a contractor, you've developed it, there's complex issues around the IP. It's not an easy theme. So, um, Again, I encourage dialogue. We need dialogue. We need dialogue. We need that, you know, coming faster and, and with level heads. So uh, that's that's how I think about it. So uh, like a good example of which was uh, the Boeing CEO recently testified, I think it was yesterday, in front of Congress. And he said that he was aware of retaliation against uh, whistleblowers. So let's, let's just say that uh, theoretically, a high-ranking executive at Northrop Grumman uh, is perhaps behind some of, uh, uh, and it could be any contract. We'll just use Northrop Grumman as an example. But say, let's say that that executive, uh, very high up executive, is well aware and maybe behind some of the retaliation against against whistleblowers, and they go public. If if it is, it, would that kind of a company collapse uh, occur? If if uh, let's just say, oh, it was uh, you know Joe Bob on our board of directors that knew about this, but he hidn't hid it from everyone else. Would would it if it were if they just kind of blamed it on one executive, the sort of criminal misdeeds of of their company? Would that still have a massive impact in terms of how uh, stockholders would view the valuation of that company? I would certainly think so. Any aer aerospace defense company that comes out and it's and it's known that somebody in the C-suite was aware, which that would be the presumption, right? That somebody in the C-suite, you know, has to know something that's going on. It's got to be making it up that chain of command. What is C-suite? Sorry, uh, what, what does C-suite mean? Yeah, basically, you know, chief executive officer, Got chief it. financial officer. So um, kind of the top level of the the, uh, the organization and the, the corporate hierarchy. Um, if that takes place, I my belief, you know, as a professional trader is that they would just get, their stock would just get smoked. I mean, and immediately. Now, that's not to say that it couldn't recover um, and likely over time would, but that recovery and that, you know, getting hit, it's, it's kind of... They're going to need to peel the bandaid off. And again, this is my point that they need to be thinking about, I'm sure they are, how are they going to deal with that? Who's, who's going to be the, who, who's going to be uh, sacrificed and, you know, have that blame laid at their, you know, their feet. Um, it's a messy situation for sure.
Let, let's say, for instance, that uh, that the government or or whoever the, from the government side, the, the stakeholder is in this technology, uh, be it a senior executive service level person, uh, directs a uh, directs an executive at at say like a Northrop Grumman to conduct in kinetic retaliation against people that would potentially uh, reveal the program or whatever. Do, if it's if it's coming from the government and they they are directing executives. Uh, to do something of that nature, are they? Is that a get out of jail card or get out of jail card free for uh, members of of the board or upper level management at say Northrop Grumman? Would be guessing as to how this works, since I'm I'm not an attorney. Um, my guess would be that it would be a little bit of both. So you might have, you know, indemnification from the government. So, you know, if the CIA has blessed you to to do something and use, you know, contractors for, you know, maintaining national secrecy, then they are going to have perhaps a get out of jail with the government. But we live in the most litigious country in the world. And there's zero doubt in my mind that you would just have a flurry of lawsuits. You know, it could be shareholder lawsuits for the disclosure issues. And this goes back to my other, you know, comment in that I think the aerospace defense industry is is probably having some regrets the mere fact that they're public <laughs> companies right now. Yeah. So yeah, that's 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 not helping them. So get out of jail on one side and then just get sued into oblivion on on the other side is is how I would imagine it playing out. Yeah, or 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 uh, get into jail in uh, in the literal sense. What <laughs> might be the other thing yes. uh, as well? Okay, so uh, you know, so these companies will say like Northrop Grumman or Lockheed Martin that theoretically have a reverse engineered uh, technology, off world technology. I mean, I mean, these folks would hold such enormous uh, political power since they own this, or or at least are in possession of of this stuff, and and we'll just say like theoretically they've been able to, to develop it and figure out how they're going to deploy it. So, so they have this intellectual property. How would the American government prevent this kind of monopolization of, of this technology by just, you know, a, a few, uh, a few contractors? I think that if this were the fifties and the sixties, the, the U S government would, you know, let them do that and, and monopolize the power and collaborate together on it. I think that in today's world, as we, you know, head close towards 2025, I think the fragility of multiple types of power structures is so high that that's less of a, an available option. I don't see, I, I don't doubt that they wouldn't try some type of monopolization, but the success for it, I would say the success rate is probably going to be super low. Do you think that, uh, let's say that that it is monopolized and the government doesn't doesn't do anything about it, would would we'll just say the potential monopolization of this tech would would I mean would it really have a a a sort of devastating effect on competitors uh, you know driving out driving them out of business in sh short order because you know we're not just like talking about like one processor uh, we'll say a, a CPU from Intel uh, versus like a new competitor that comes out with just you know the next generation. Uh, processor that's maybe only a few gigahertz or whatever uh, faster. I mean, this is, you know, one business that holds this tech that is uh, just far and above anything that anyone ever, ever has. Would the, I would think, would you agree that, that because there's such a, a, would be such a disparity in terms of the tech holdings of one company versus another, that it, it could potentially run enormous amounts of business out of business? It, it, again, it would seem like that, and that would be the normal. That would be a um, a normal way to think about it. But again, I think that there's so many vulnerability points right now. So, for example, there's a whole renaissance in the defense tech industry going on. You know, right in you know your backyard in El Segundo, there's all these startups in the defense industry. You've got Andoro, which is you know raising tons of awareness. This kind of uh, you know just renaissance for American defense tech. Um, I think that what you would see happen is you would see a lot of these people that are in the in the program, if you will, I think they're going to just leave. And it, it would be way, way more exciting to to leave a Lockheed or a Northrop or whoever else is out there and go do, you know, startups. Um, the other thing too that would happen is at the moment that it's revealed that that tech is actually there, imagine the scientific community 
So everybody that works at a university that was like, ah, no, this doesn't exist. The moment it's confirmed that it does, the number of brain cells that are working away on this and saying, oh, okay, let's figure this out, I think would just flip overnight. And I think a lot of other people would rapidly figure out how the tech works. Um, so I think those lead times that used to be more significant in the past are a, a lot, lot, lot less uh, than, you know, than we would have seen previously. What, what kind of thing or what sort of policies could uh, the government create to to sort of pre, sort of be like a backstop or, or prevent these these issues that we, you know, that we spoke about in terms of uh, like a Northrop uh, Grumman having these things and not telling their uh, their shareholders or Northrop Grumman executives uh, engaging in retaliation against whistleblowers or or making sure that none of this tech uh, with uh, Northrop Grumman or Lockheed Martin or maybe some others, it's not monopolized. What what role should the government play in that in terms of, of policy to sort of mitigate those issues? Yeah, the, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to the, you know, the criminal experts as far as what the legal course of action would be best for for investigating and pursuing that. From a financial background, I think that we should get third-party auditors and forensic accountants into the situation immediately, like yesterday, because that's also going to dictate kind of the, you know, the, the stakes at the table, right? So if we find out that, hey, they really did legitimately develop a lot of the IP with their own money on their own time, their own scientists, okay, well, then we're going to feel very different about, you know, the role the IP plays in their own portfolio. If we find out that a lot of money was diverted to these black budgets in enormous amounts, and these guys are holding on to that IP, and that was financed by the US taxpayer, that's a very, very different type of conversation. So I would, you know, stress the importance of getting, you know, and forget getting government accountants. We really need forensic accountants of which the United States is filled with lots of talented ones. We need forensic accountants all over this situation as fast as possible, in my opinion. I think that that completely makes sense. So of course, there would be the issue of, of how you handle that from a uh, security clearance point of view, but but you know there there are a lot people a lot smarter than uh, myself that can figure that out. Now I want to go back to the energy component again. How politically destabilizing would this revolution be in, let's say, like Middle East countries such as Saudi Arabia, and even for the United States, which, as many people may not know, is actually the number one oil producer. Yeah, that's an important point. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned that about the United States as an oil producer, because you're right. Most people are absolutely unaware of our, our own position in the, you know, in the in the sector. So I think that the the issue to watch and um, I, I acknowledge the work of Matt Pines bringing awareness to this subject. I don't know if you know, Matt. he's amazing. Yeah, Matt, he's great. And that's, Matt's been talking about for quite some time the the strategy that the Middle East is using and deploying capital into artificial intelligence, into chips, into the space race and everything. And I think we need to be very, very sensitive to what's going on there. The general view is that as you know, this disruption comes out, what do our adversaries do? And adversaries, you know, primarily being defined as, you know, Russia and China in this aspect, because they would have the resources to do some things, maybe Iran. Um, but I think that we would be naive if we're not looking at how the Middle East would react and and adapt. Um, I certainly don't think they would sit still. And if they're not paying attention to this issue yet close your eyes, wake up tomorrow. And they, they are. Um, so these are very key. These are very key issues. And this is, this is these butterfly effects, right? You flap your wings and, you know, all of a sudden you've got storms in different parts of the world. Um, so not an easy answer, but all the more reason to, you know, to get those conversations going, get level-headed people that are really great at strategy, um, kind of role-playing these things out, figure out how we want to, to present ourselves in the world and what leadership, you know, in a post, you know, fossil fuel world can post potentially look like. And, and do you think countries like Saudi Arabia, which rely on oil as their primary source of income, I mean, do you think that they are like right now beginning to prepare for this? Are, there, are they having serious discussions and indeed gaming this out? At least from people that I talk to, and, and my job is to, you know, talk to people all around the world every day. We talk to trade desks every day. Um, I don't yet see this on their radar, but 
again, my concern is just it's the ability for people to come up to speed on themes. Um, and we see this in our own community. So you and I having grown, uh, grown up around the subject, there's a lot of people that have only come into it recently or since 2017, and they're incredibly well informed. So these are the things that we try and think differently is that, yes, if somebody it's back to the lead time issue, right? I think that where we're going to be, you know, we need to be cautious is thinking that there's a significant lead time that can be gained. I just, I just don't believe that. And so I think we need to think very carefully about how strategy works um, in that type of environment. Okay, so we, you know, we've spoken about the the impact on the energy sector. We've spoken about the uh, the impact on the military industrial complex. But I want to sort of bring it down to just you know, mom and pa kettle sitting at home. So, with with let's say like an official disclosure, let's say President Biden or whoever the next president is gets up in front of the White House. Uh, at the White House podium and says on national TV uh, or an address in the Oval Office, which might be a better place to do it, but you know, says on national TV exactly what Colonel Carl Nell said, that we there's a non-human intelligence here. It's been here for a long time. Uh, it's interacting with us. Uh, we've had a bunch of government officials that, uh, non-elected government officials that have covered this up. Uh, and that uh, private aerospace contractors, uh, such as theoretically uh, Northrop Grumman and others, have been involved in all of this. Do you think that the world would would just kind of melt down economically? Would there, for instance, be a rush on the banks? Everybody's going to the going to their ATMs and pulling out all of the cash out of their savings and whatnot. Would there be a rush on the banks? Would would people decide just out of just kind of going nuts over this whole thing, uh, would they decide, you know what, I'm not going to even bother paying my mortgage? It's it's entirely possible. So I'm going to give you a couple different scenarios, one of which I tested with a very good friend of mine that's a, a global macro uh, hedge fund manager, former uh, macro hedge fund manager. So he reached out to me a couple months ago, a good pal of mine. He says, all right, Dave, listen, you, you been talking about this for a while. I'm coming around. I'm seeing this stuff at salt. Like there's, there's something going on. I'm persuaded. And he goes, but look, at the end of the day, I've got to gas up my car and I've got to take my kids to school. And, you know, most Americans I think would believe that, you know, we're not alone in the universe and certainly things could be visiting us. So the question that he posed to me was, you know, so what is this actually like, I don't think society would collapse. I think that we would be just fine. Okay. Now I'm going to give you my counter to it. And then I'm going to tell you what I think is the, the answer for, for leadership to, to handle this. So I said to him, I said, look, let's play a game. Let's say that I'm president Biden and you're the press corps. And, you know, I come out and say exactly what you just said, Matt, right? So they're here. This is the issue. Da, 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 da. What's your first question? So he says, okay, I like this game. His first question to me was, where are they from? My response to him, I said, well, some of them, some of them are, you know, our descendants 50,000 years into the future. Some are from here. Some are crossing dimensions. And it's probably a mixed bag of things. His head exploded. <laughs> he was right. just like, oh my God, I, you know, what? And so what it did was it provoked a reaction out of him. And this is where, where I think we need to be, you know, conscientious of the way that we communicate is that this is going to create an exploding fractal of questions, right? So for every piece of what's really going on is disclosed and it should be disclosed, it's going to generate a lot of questions. And since it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible to answer all the questions that come, I think that we need to start with a much a uh, much more logical starting point. That logical starting point is that even our government and everyday life, there's this presumption that we're just, we're always safe. You know, you buckle, you know, your seatbelt, you get in the car, you got airbags, as if that's always going to save your life. And despite all the wonderful things we do and the reduction in, you know, accidents that are on our highways or deaths from accidents, it's still possible bad things happen. You don't know. You get hit by a comet walking out of your door in the morning. You slip and bang your head. So we we need to, the message that I would convey to people is, look, we don't live in a risk-free world. We're not supposed to. There's tons of risks around us. We do our best to adapt and understand those, those risks. And I think that this is the appropriate message that government should be coming out with because, look, it's indisputable. There's things violating our airspace. That's a fact. It's happening all the time, probably a lot more than we all realize. And so I understand the reluctance of, you know, our military to tell folks that, hey, you know, it's our job to keep things out of the airspace, but things are coming here. Okay. 
but then let's get realistic with that, you know, we can't. And that doesn't mean that society needs to collapse. It means that we need to collaborate and look for better ways to deal with this and understand with what we're dealing with. This is a very long-winded way of answering your question, Matt, and saying that it's it's the method of delivery and the message that I think is more important than than anything else. That that completely makes sense. So so let's say theoretically that that this comes out and society, you know, kind of maybe even worse than sort of the societal reaction to COVID-19. People are hoarding toilet paper and and uh, just in general, it seems that society is disrupted. And, and we'll, we'll say not to like to the point where people are are pulling all their money out of the banks, but just that level of uh, of societal disruption, maybe just a little bit similar to what happened with COVID-19, how much of that societal instability would actually affect the global markets? Oh, it would be very easy to happen. And so as somebody that traded the the pandemic, so I've traded, you know, three global outbreaks, have traded the SARS outbreak, outbreaks in Ebola and COVID. And we did exceptionally well with that because we were tracking that data very, very early. It was an exponential thing spreading. People were paying attention, even though it wasn't clear yet as how severe the mortality would be. Um, I think that, you know, back to, you know, the the analogy of like, there's going to be impact. The question is, how do we, we can't eliminate it, so we can look for ways to dampen it. And markets surprisingly can be, when left to their, you know, left to their own without intervention, can be incredible, incredible dampeners. Um, And again, COVID's a good example. I would never have guessed while I was on the short side of the market as things were spreading and and betting that people wouldn't really be able to assess the, you know, the risk and impact. Um, I was stunned myself, even being a, you know, career trader, the rebound, the rebound was absolutely profound. So markets, you know, they tanked real hard, but they rebounded and, you know, a lot of people did very well and people, you know, adapted. So I think that, the impacts though are going to be, you know, significant. And I think that what we need to look at for that is we need to look at the other kind of cracks in the system because those will be the vulnerability points. And, you know, that's a, in fact, let's, let's talk about some of the things that are on the last two slides. If you want to pop up slide, you know, five, we'll do slide five and six, because this is great examples for the audience. So one of the things that, you know, again, I don't think people are really grasping, you know, the fragility of where we are just with conflict in the world. Nuclear spending is up 13% this year, and clearly the United wow. States is leading on this. And this is to be clear for the audience. This is for n- nuclear weapons. This is not for, you know, nuclear power our stations, you know, to power the new AI chips and everything else. No, this is for nuclear weapons. This is a terrifying, terrifying trend. Um, and kudos to Annie Jacobson and, and her book, Nuclear War. She's, you know, trying to wave the flag and, and get everybody to pay attention to just how fragile and sensitive conflict is right now. And which, by the way, that there may be correlation as to why UAP is showing up again. You know, everybody that listens to your show is well aware of the correlation between uh, nukes and, and UFOs. It's very well documented and understood. So so you have that as a fragility point. You have conflict and spending on, on weapons. And then if we go to the next slide, the next slide shows the the incredibly enormous amount of debt that is outstanding. And this is absolutely, I don't care what anybody's politics are. This is just math. This is unsustainable. And right. we're just burying our head in the sand and, and acting like it doesn't matter. So to me, I think that we need to look at like what I would do as a, as a macro investor and understanding, or at least you know, thinking I have a better than average understanding of what's going on with UAP, I would be looking at where it's going to inflict the most pain as markets try and react. So the most important thing we can do is one part, how the narrative is conveyed, but it's also patching up and putting some shock absorbers in the market and being responsible with some of the other things that have to be addressed. Um, That's how I see it. That, that completely makes sense. And even like, I mean, it, it is it is truly frightening the amount of money that's being spent on on uh, our, our 
strategic nuclear weapons. You know, for instance, the the Minuteman one, our, 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 I'm sorry, the Minuteman three, our land based uh, strategic nuclear deterrent, which only has uh, they they call it demerving, but they went down to one warhead versus uh, three as as part of uh, one of uh, our uh, our nuclear weapons treaties. But now they're talking about uh, you know pulling out all the W87 and W78 warheads and remerving uh, our our Minuteman three uh, missile uh, 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 platforms, which you know takes it up to three warheads. Uh, per intercontinental ballistic missile. So I, I think that we are certainly when it comes to national security and as you know, as you mentioned, what is going on with the spending that has taken place with the with of course the modernization of our uh, our uh, strategic nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons, their delivery platforms, and then also this this decision uh, that the I think it was the Department of Energy was was recently speaking about, and I think this is uh, of course in reaction to what's going on with Russia, but then also you look at at China, which is can uh, which is investing a considerable amount in their land-based uh, strategic nuclear deterrent. So here we are, the United States, having to uh, deal with uh, potentially more warheads on either side of our foreign adversaries. And we're just, it's, it's, it's a, a truly a travesty, the amount of money uh, that our country uh, or all countries are spending on this, these horrible weapons that theoretically will never be used. But we, um, and I think you, you spoke about this earlier, we are, uh, the, the world geopolitically, uh, uh, economically, certainly environmentally, we are not on a good course. And and there was, uh, you know, there was one, I think it was uh, Christopher Mellon at the Soul, uh, the Soul Foundation conference back in November, spoke about that, that the current trajectory that we are on, uh, it doesn't. It doesn't even matter what nation you're talking about, but just as a as a species, the the current trajectory that we are on, we are on is just um, it's we it's it's a really bad really bad spot and something from a, a ontological shock uh, perspective. Many of us feel, and I feel the same way. This kind of thing, uh, talking about revealing to the world or, or confirming or whatever you want to call it, uh, that that we have this non-human technology and it's here. It, it seems like that is really sort of the only card left to play in terms of shocking uh, the world population and world governments into into just bringing back some some common sets. And, um, you know, and just the fact that that Going back to the energy thing, I mean, energy is a political weapon in a global economic sense. So let's take, for instance, China. They build a coal plant in uh, in an African country uh, that is is uh, is not doing particularly well economically, and then that nation is e economically and politically dependent on China. So the whole UAP issue, like just from a a global power balance of power perspective, what are your views in terms of of how uh, how that whole revelation, the, the, this UAP thing, what kind of impact is that going to have uh, in terms of the balance of political power and the downstream economic consequences of, uh, of that? It's, it's monumental. And I'll tell you one of the things that I think about a lot, um, and I don't think this area of the, the phenomenon gets enough attention, um, although folks that have been around it for a long time are, are aware of the, the biomimicry aspect. And I'm going to tie this into ex exactly, you know, how it relates to all these, these conflicts. So biomimicry is a whole field of study and working in environmental markets. I know a lot of professionals that are in it and biomimicry is effectively, you know, looking at nature and mimicking that through, you know, technology. Um, one great example of that is new forms of paint that mimic the way that uh, feathers for uh, scarlet macaws work. So the reason their feathers are always so bright is because it's actually little prisms in their feathers that bend the light and make you see those colors. That's why they're, you know, the color never fades. So that's an example of, you know, biomimicry. There's lots and lots of, you know, historical records and present information about, you know, this, this mimicking effect of the phenomenon. And I think this is very important because if we continue to leave it to the military, and the government to to reflect their views and look their job is to protect us and be secure and that's 
you know, thank God they do. It's wonderful, wonderful, you know, people that allow us to sleep well at night. However, you're you're reflecting this thing back. So if the phenomenon part of what it's doing is reflecting this this posture that humanity is taking, we have to really understand what that's about. And this is not to suggest that, you know, whatever we're dealing with is is all kind or benevolent either. I, I in fact I doubt that it it all is. I think that it's a mixed bag there too. Same. Um so I think that the opportunity set is if we look at, we got to get to the conversation with NHI. Like this is, you know, you can't get to UAP without NHI. You start looking at NHI, it's, well, what's the relationship there? What are the conversations? You know, are there hostilities? Are there, you know, is there benevolence? If we look at how much everybody's already spending and placing trust in AI for decision making, how fast that happened. I mean, it just happened practically overnight and it's only going to get stronger. Then we should be asking ourselves that, hey, look, if there is intelligence that's much smarter than us, just like we're depending on AI, if there is an HI that does have our best interests, we should definitely be having a global dialogue about that, understanding what it is, and perhaps just seek guidance, ask them. What's going on? Have you seen this playbook before? You know, there's there's opportunities here, you know, amongst the chaos, but it requires, you know, sober, you know, conversations and 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 trying to understand things as they are, not as we want them to to be. Completely makes sense to me. I think uh, it was interesting. I was I was at a conference recently and was speaking to the experiencer uh, uh, Chris Bledsoe, uh, who in the UAP circles is very well known, and uh, you know, I was talking to him about the whole like kind of reflective nature of of this phenomenon and and how all of this would go for all of us as a species if this NHI decides to reveal itself or you know however that would come about but as he pointed out the phenomenon is reflective so it's going to react in a way that is reflective of how we approach it. So if we are all behaving like a bunch of uh, idiots uh, and are warmongering and all of these things that, that of course, uh, we are known for as, as humans, it is not going to react in a, in a, a very good way. So I, I think that's a very good point. Now, another question, and this sort of harkens yes. back to what occurred. Uh, sorry, go ahead. You were going to say something? No, I was just saying what Chris's comment makes makes sense. You know, I think the question is, you know, is that applicable to all aspects of the phenomenon or just one of the NHIs that, that we're dealing with? Or is this getting into, you know, the more complex conversations of, you know, what's our understanding of reality and, and, and consciousness, which is a whole, you know, another channel that's also important at some point to, to really get into. Yeah, it, it, uh, David, it's it's definitely a mixed a mixed bag, and from what I understand, it is multiple species that are here, and I'm sure as with uh, anything in in the universe, there good and bad is a, a universal uh, sort of uh, law of physics. I I would uh, you know I would uh, offer up for your consideration. Now let's jump to again to sort of uh, the the kind of stability aspect of of revealing this. One question that that came to mind, like when I go back and I look at what happened with the global pandemic with COVID-19, and I remember one of the first times I, I went to the grocery store and saw that vegetables were no longer on the shelves. I mean, just the, the shock of that. How, in your view, will disclosure affect global food security? It's, you know, there's a lot of things. It could be, you know, energy security. It could be, you know, food security. It can be a lot of different things all all at once, which one kind of cracks or breaks is, is yet to be seen. Um, but all else being equal, humans tend to panic. And, you know, I say this as a professional that's studied, you know, markets. I live and work in Latin America and, you know, you've seen shelves cleared out, you know, with hyperinflation and, and different crises. So um, I think that there's certainly a, going to be a strong tendency to, to panic. And again, this is where the only solution I can think of, and I'm sure there's there's many, many others, is it's a leadership equation, right? So, you know, if Jeff Bezos and, you know, Amazon need to reassure people like, don't worry, your goods are going to get to you. If, you know, the the car deals of the world that are our big grain traders and, and make, you know, food move around the globe are saying, hey, listen, don't worry, we've got, you know, we've got plans. We don't see our ships being, you know, uh, you know, taken by UFOs. You know, they're going to continue to transport grain. Um, we need to start to build a collective of, you know, of, just cool heads. And, and I 
see, you know, glimmers of that. In fact, you know, my hat's off to to you and all the crew at the UAP Disclosure Fund. I think what you guys are doing is just enormously important. And you guys have a wonderful mix of, you know, contributors to, to what you're doing. And, and similar, Soul Foundation and, you know, the New Paradigm Institute, we need more of that. And, and and I'm eager to see those those organizations grow and expand out into the to the business community as well, where we get kind of you know leaders of industry to to join and uh, provide you know provide insight into to how things will be okay. Do you foresee the this news coming out in terms of of uh, coming out from say like an American president? Do you see this as jeopardizing the political stability of the United States government itself? It could. It certainly could. I think that it's a it's also a tough equation for, you know, anybody, especially at the presidential level. I think what they have to weigh against is, you know, does another president get out in front of them? And I think that that risk rises every single day. So again, you're kind of in this this game theory position. You know, do you go first? Do you wait and see what, you know, a leader from another nation does? I think that the view from other nations is a little bit of, hey, let's see what happens with the U.S. Let's watch and see if the U.S. populace reacts bad if a U.S. president does it. I have that. That's just a sense, not a, you know, I don't know that for any fact, but um, that would be an intelligent game theory for our adversaries to be, you know, to be watching. Um, The question is, is, is there a moment, an inflection point where it becomes advantageous for them to jump first? Does leadership work better for them? Um, so, not an easy decision. I, I don't. Uh, I don't envy any any president, you know, having to you know to make that decision. But I, you know, certainly admire the president's step forward in the face of that and and do it anyways. Yeah, I I, I think they should. And and when we were at or when I was at the Seoul conference, now I was only there for for the second day of it. But this was part of what Colonel Carl Nell was speaking about in terms of controlled disclosure versus uncontrolled disclosure. And of course, one of the elements or, or sort of tenets of undisclosed, uh, I'm sorry, uncontrolled disclosure is that NHI reveals itself. Uh, and of course, the ensuing panic that would happen happen with that because the public hasn't been business, hasn't been prepped for this. But the other thing that Colonel Nell also brought up was what falls into that bucket of catastrophic disclosure is China or Russia going first. So what I've said many, many times on on the show, and you know, as you mentioned, we have uh, lots of folks uh, in Congress that watch the show, and I have no idea if any American presidents do. I kind of doubt it. <laughs> Maybe some of their staffers do. But the thing that you have to consider is if you are a former American president, um, and let's say President Obama, or let's say that a, a former President Trump wins this election cycle, which I certainly hope doesn't happen, but uh, but let's say that he does, uh, that sitting president, for instance, if it were President Trump and he wins, he could rightfully say, look at all of these former presidents that hid this from you. I, you know, I, I, to be honest, I, I used to make fun of, of Trump and his whole deep state yeah. stuff, but it turns out Trump was absolutely right with that. So let's say theoretically Trump does win and he says, look at all these presidents, Republican and Democrat, uh, that have hidden this from all of you. They've lied to you. Uh, these American presidents that were fully read in, and from what I understand, some presidents have not been fully read in, such as our current president, uh, amazingly so, which... Uh, is just wildly disappointing. Uh, but, you know, but this this president could get up and say, look at what all these former presidents hid from you. They jeopardized your national security. They knew that there was this sort of like deep state or, or rogue group of around 50, 50-ish uh, as sort of a senior executive service level people. Uh, you've had these uh, defense contractors uh, like uh, theoretically Northrop Grumman uh, that have had this stuff uh, and maybe Lockheed Martin that have hid these things. Uh, these uh, these uh, security, um, excuse me, these uh, defense contractors have utilized their uh, their contract security services, uh, say like a Blackwater or something, something of the sort uh, that uh, they were used to physically retaliate against a potential whistleblowers, former uh, people in national security, former government officials. So this president can, can essentially say, look at all of this illegality that former presidents, both Democrat and Republican, have engaged in for 
decades upon decades. They all lied to you. And what I would say to President Biden, well, actually, I would say to uh, his national security uh, uh, advisor, Jake Sullivan, and and the National Security Council, which from what I understand, they have all decided not to brief President Biden on this because A, they're worried about his health, his age, and, and frankly, at, at any American president with what is going on in the world politically, they, that president, uh, President Biden, certainly has, has, his, has his hands full. But let's just say that, that President Biden is, hopefully, these people wake up and read him into all of this thing. If, if I were the sitting president, of course, it is, it is, a, it is a sticky ball of wax, a, a big ball of yarn that they would have to unwind. But... I would say say to that sitting president, think about your legacy, because if whoever follows you in office goes and dumps this, which it is going to happen, I guarantee you, the amount of questions that will come your way as a former sitting president, as uh, a, a staffer uh, to this uh, to a former sitting president, people are going to be asking a lot of questions. They are going to be mad as hell. So uh, that's that's why I say to, to to the folks in Washington, and if, if there are folks uh, listening in in the in, in the uh, Biden administration, somebody is going to rip the bandaid off. It is either going to be you or it is going to be somebody else. And if it is somebody that comes after you, everybody is going to be looking back at you and saying, what kind of president were you to not tell the world about this? So, um, yeah, I, I, I certainly hope these folks think about that. I certainly, uh, uh, as, a, as a Democrat, I would encourage uh, President Obama, from, in, from what I was told, was read in completely into the program, although strangely after he left office. But if I were President Obama, I would talk to, his, uh, to President Biden's National Security Council and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and say, look, you got to tell Biden about this. And more importantly, you guys need to take this opportunity and do the right thing and level with the American public, if not, uh, if not the world, about what is what is going on. So, so let's game this out. So, you're the president of the United States. You're President Biden, and you get up uh, tomorrow and you disclose this. Walk us through the timeline of how you think the world markets would react if you had a crystal ball and were just to kind of guess at how all of this would go down. First thing is markets sell off. That's, you know, that's just, you know, gut reaction is that markets, markets don't handle, you know, surprises very well. So markets would sell off as people try and determine what's going on. Maybe gold prices spike as people say, well, you know, if the aliens are here, I want to at least try and hold something physical because financial institutions maybe are not going to be reliable. Typical things that you would see in, in normal, you know, market crisis. Um, but a sell-off would be the most probable scenario, especially if this is, you know, being announced. I think there would be a lag time for a moment as people try and digest, is it true? Did I just watch a, you know, an AI generated video of a U.S. president saying that this is, <laughs> right. is in fact going on? Right. Um, but yeah, as soon as they digest it is that, yeah, that's coming directly out of the White House. Um, I think the reactions would come very quick as, as people then try and, you know, struggle to decide what does this mean? And I think that that's why the messaging is so, so important because the prediction on market collapse is actually very easy. It just spreads. It's a contagion. All markets sell off. The dollar spikes because people are closing out stock and bond positions. So this is one of the things that usually surprises people when you get a market crisis, the dollar is very well. And that's a function of market dynamics. If I'm selling my entire stock portfolio, what do I get when I sell it? Well, I get dollars, right? So you get this kind of spike in the dollar, not because it's great, but because it's the settlement currency for the majority of the world's assets. Um, so you have those typical dynamics. And and that to me is relatively easy to, to predict. The question is, what is the way to prevent that? How do you prevent that? You have to be able to provide some type of understanding to people, what does this mean? Is there opportunity? Can you kind of pair it with a positive message that, hey, look, yeah, regret to tell you, you know, X, Y, Z, but on the bright side, you don't have to worry about climate change anymore because we've got this super awesome, you know, new tech and we're going to have clean right. energy. If that message is not paired, you're going to have, you're just going to have, you know, chaos. 
I think. I think that that would be the probable uh, outcome. Um, so messaging is everything. Messaging is everything on this. Um, but to your point, and I think we we both agree with this. I completely concur with everything that you're saying. They got to do it. It's not. This is not a. It's not a game to play. We're like, okay, well, we'll wait. There's there's clearly something else going on that's driving this. Many have said that it's NHI itself. I I suspect similarly. I think NHI will have the final word as to to how this rolls out. And so you know, leadership shouldn't be waiting. You should be looking at like, okay, well, here's what we know. This is what we're going to do about it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, rather than getting caught off guard, which will be you know orders of magnitude worse, in my opinion. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so right here, right now, if, if there are uh, asset managers that are watching this show, how right now would you convince them that the UAP issue could significantly impact their portfolio value and this whole thing is, is completely worth their attention? I think here's how I would frame it. Number one, if they believe that it's real, then it's a very easy mental leap for any professional manager to understand that it has outsized impact. You don't need to be a global macro specialist like me to to realize that you're probably looking at some very outsized risk if markets sell off. Um, so I think that part would be very easy. I think what's important is one, of course, every investment manager needs to look at this. They need to be very aware of what they're holding, how they're thinking about it, but they also need to use, look, the financial sector is an enormous source of, of power and influence by its by virtue of what it is, right? And I think that, you know, my message to, you know, colleagues that are in the financial space and, and you know, everybody else that's in this sector, please don't look at this through the lens of, hey, let me get my hands on, let me be the first VC through the door to invest in anti-gravity, right? That's not the that's not the role we need you to play. There'll be those opportunities, there'll be a ton of things, you know, perhaps on, on the upside that will spin off of this. And and people can chase that at their their leisure. But the more important thing is, you know, there's a lot of huge money managers out there, you know, and they are stewards and fiduciaries for considerable savings for Americans and and others around the globe. And so to me, I see that they have a responsibility to to look at this, take this conversation seriously and use their voices as well. My message to them would be first and foremost, use your power to influence to get this conversation moved forward with Congress and, and our leaders in Washington, D.C. You use your voice there before you go moving your portfolio around. That will have a much, much, much more valuable impact on your portfolio, short, medium, and long term. Couldn't agree more. Uh, and hopefully we will be having more sorts of conversations uh, like this uh, that we've uh, that I had with you. Uh, and really appreciate you coming on the show. I, I think this is kind of the one uh, one area where we, at least that I'm aware of, uh, have had someone with your like yourself with the bona fides that you do in, in the financial markets come in and discuss this really pretty, I mean, it's a very, very serious topic. And as you mentioned, uh, just you know, economically, from a finance point of view, uh, from a political point of view, uh, it this this it, this can just can't be kept being kicked uh, down the road. Burying your head in the sand is not a recipe for success, uh, certainly for the United States of America. So, um, as the last question, as as someone that that works in this world, do you think Elon Musk knows about all of this? Have you ever ever heard anything? Oh my God! One of my friends who's going to watch this. <laughs> Is, uh, is is going to be laughing on the floor because we we got into a lengthy conversation on this just a couple nights ago and um so that's i don't know it, and what they were saying is effectively they were saying come on how can this be real elon musk says that you know if it was real he would know and he doesn't you know he doesn't believe they they exist um there's a lot of responses to that coincidentally i'll tell you just a very short story i actually please. met his right right hand uh right hand men at spacex several years ago and he actually brought up the topic and he practically laughed me off the you know off my seat at the dinner table saying what an absurd notion wow. um yeah, which is crazy. And and it is just, eh, look, you've been around the subject, Matt, you get this a lot. And, and most people, they just kind of react without thought or knowledge um, and, and are very dismissive. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I would think Elon would know, certainly with his access to satellites. It's pretty obvious. Right. I, how could he not have data? But right. 
no idea. I don't know what his position is, but it's a, it's, it's a good question. I hope he listens to this show and he can finally shed some light on what's going on because um, either he's, he's ignorant, you know, in the politest sense of the word, um, or he knows and he's not saying, which isn't cool either. And is, is again, not the, the path that we need forward. Yeah. And, and I would, I would venture to guess as well, if, uh, if uh, let's say President Biden gets out and, and dumps this dumps this whole thing, probably one of the first uh, people that would get asked uh, this question about what did you know and when you knew it, uh, Elon Musk would certainly be at the top of the list. So it, it I, I don't think uh, if it came out that he knew about it and hid this, this would do any favors for him in terms of his uh, his his public credibility and certainly would not hurt, uh, would not help the valuation of his companies, I, I would think. Well, well, David, thank you so much uh, for joining us. How, how can people follow your work and where can uh, people follow uh, your, your firm door? Yeah, well, well or damn, you, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> that's, a, yeah. that's a that's okay. The original name was Door Asset Management, so you're not you're, you're not far off. Close, Close enough. Yeah. Thank, yeah, thank you for having me on the show, man. I really appreciate the opportunity. And again, just want to you know, reiterate, I'm very grateful for what you and, and, and your crew and others have been doing because you guys are doing meaningful, meaningful, meaningful work on this topic. And it's a, it's a labor of love, uh, and passion. So thank you for that. And thank you for the opportunity to be on here. Folks that are interested in my, you know, my views on, on the topic and, uh, global macro in general, I'm active on X. You can find me there, David Dorr, D-O-R-R, or just look me up and hit me up on, on LinkedIn. That's the easiest way to, uh, to track me down. Awesome. Well, David, thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to having you back on the show. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Have a wonderful day. Yeah, wow. Uh, wh- what an amazing interview. It's 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 great to see that more and more people, I, you know, I know I always kind of talk about this whole topic from the national security lens or the legislative lens, certainly the political lens, but uh, it, it, it really, I'm glad we have people in finance such, uh, such as David Doerr that are are taking this topic seriously as i've said time and time again this this whole topic is 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 such a complicated issue that we as just a species we need our best and brightest to not be you know waiting for the next shoe to drop we need to be looking at this now and and gaming this out so that when this does pop, which it is going to happen, we are, as, as a species, we're ready, uh, ready for this uh, economically, we're ready for this uh, politically, uh, uh, from a religious, theological point of view. Uh, it, this is going to come out. And, and I know that it's very easy for people in, in power, uh, be it in, uh, in private aerospace or in, in politics, be it in Congress, or more in particular, the executive branch, in the Department of Defense and the intelligence community to say, you know what, we we've kept all of this in the in the this toothpaste in the tube for 80, 90, whatever number of years that we've been at this. And we'll just wait another uh, four or five years. This is all going to die down. People are going to forget about it. But what I would say to all of you, especially those of you on Capitol Hill that watch this, uh, I certainly would love to think that there are members in the executive branch and the Biden administration that are, are watching this. This is going to happen. This is going to come out. It. We are not in 1950 where the government tells the public something and and they just believe it uh, uh, without any sort of sort of uh, questioning you've you've got uh, at least speaking as a united states citizen you have a large swath of the american popul- population that does not trust government you've got that you've got uh, the the fact that we have social media where the, the Pentagon, and in particular the CIA, uh, which has been the portfolio holder of the UAP UFO issue, the CIA has also been uh, the source, along with the uh, Air Force Office of Special Investigation, uh, that has been running this entire disinformation campaign on the American populace, and in particular now on members of Congress, uh, to keep all this stuff uh, from spilling out. But it is out. It is not going back in. And the amount of illegality, the amount of, of federal crimes that have been committed by a lot of these stakeholders is is profound. It is going to come out. So if if you're uh, if you're somebody in the Biden administration, now is the time to to take this seriously and 
like I said earlier in the program, let's say President, uh, I'm sorry, former President Trump wins the election. I think personally, out of any American president that we've had uh, that could win the White House, uh, that would potentially dump it, I would say with pretty good confidence that if Trump wins, he is going to be that guy. So if you're the current administration and if you're National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan or if you're a member of the National Security Council and oh, by the way, President Biden is the president of the uh, is the head, the chair of the National Security Council. For those of you that have decided on your own that that you're making all these decisions behind the current president's back and have decided that he doesn't need to know about this. It is it is going to be a rude awakening for you and this administration when this comes out. And, uh, you know, I know members of Congress, especially members that are on the appropriate committees that that are wildly aware and are very aware of the illegalities uh, that have taken place with the Pentagon, with the Central Intelligence Agency, with, uh, you know, with uh, the Department of Energy in, in particular. I mean, you, you know, you saw the uh, the, the um, uh, secretary, I think, Granholm, who is the the energy secretary, when uh Republican Anna Polina uh, Luna uh, in uh, in some kind of uh, c c uh, house hearing put her on the spot and asked her essentially about UAP and whether uh, the Department of Energy has been working with Joint Special Operations Command JSOC, which by the way they have been, and uh, I can tell you that the Department of Energy, in conjunction with the CIA, these. These folks, they are working hand in hand along with Joint Special Operations Command to uh, retrieve craft of non-human origin to uh, get these craft into uh, possession of private contractors or defense uh, contractors, uh, uh, such as theoretically uh, Northrop uh, Grumman. Uh, there is there is so much um, there's so much illegality that has taken place uh, that. Uh, when people find out, as, as, I, as I say time and again, the path to reconciliation with the American public is so much, the, the chances of that going well for all of you, be it the Northrop Grumman's of the world, the Boeing's, the, uh, uh, the Lockheed Martin's, uh, the, the CIA, the Pentagon, the Department, the Department of Energy, the path to reconciliation with the American public is so much better if you do it now and you are proactive and you rip that Band-Aid off and you say to the American public in the world, look, you know, back when we decided to, to shove all this away and hide it from, from Congress, it was done during the Cold War. It was we thought it was done for the right reasons. Uh, and and look, you, you know, people make mistakes. We're all human. Uh, this thing is metastasized into this cancer. Uh, yes, uh, people have lost their lives over this. But, you know, there were some really bad decisions that were made. But if you come clean with the American public before Russia does, or China does, or some other foreign adversary, it is going to go so much better for you rather than uh, if you uh, if you just wait for the other shoe to drop. Uh, because when it drops, people are going to be looking at you, be it uh, the president in the White House, his staff, uh, these uh, these uh, defense contractors that hold this off-world material that have uh, that got stuffed in, into their possession in order to hide it from Congress. They are going to be looking at you, and they're going to be wondering what you knew, when you knew it, if you knew people lost their lives over it, if people lost their, if you knew that people lost their families and their careers over it, the amount of digging that is going to happen will be something like the likes that you have never seen. So for any of you in private aerospace, any of you defense contractor executives that are watching this, members of Congress, congressional staffers, members of the current, uh, uh, current administration uh, in, in the White House, Take heed. Now is the time to do this, because if you don't do it, somebody is going to do it and they're going to do it really damn soon. So uh, get ahead of it. Do the right thing. Put your uh, make your mark, your proper mark in world history, uh, because if somebody else does it, uh, all of you that uh, have been part of uh, covering this up, uh, hiding it from Congress, uh, hiding it from the American people, history will not look 
uh, favorably upon you. So that's all I have to say. So folks, if you enjoyed our show, we would appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button and leave a comment. Uh, I try to read all the comments. Uh, I, I usually don't have time to reply to them. Uh, I try to when I can, but I do, uh, for the most part, uh, try and read uh, every single comment that comes in. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, and also, please tell your friends about us on social media. If you're on Twitter or X, please go there right now and subscribe to us. We are at Good Trouble Show on Twitter uh, and X and all the other social media platforms at The Good Trouble Show. The more uh, we can spread our message and the more people that follow us, the more we can uh, educate everyone on, on what is really a very vital, vital topic. Uh, so we very much appreciate it. And we will see you uh, uh, probably next week with more great guests on The Good Trouble Show show.